everyone, we are back to cover the final chapter of what will be covered on the AP test. This is America in World War II. Um, you know, if, if you haven't read these last two chapters at some point, you should go back and do that um, and, and read them. And then also, you know, take notes on this and, and take notes on the lecture, write it down, you know, have it available uh, to go back over. So, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of wrapping up the course uh, this week, and then, um, then you know, next week we will start into uh, review, and we'll kind of go from there, uh, seeing what happens. So, um, so let's talk about American World War II. We kind of left off at Pearl Harbor. You know, Pearl Harbor happens. This gets America into the war uh, on that Allied side. We declare war on Japan. You know, in turn, they declare war on us. And Germany declares war on us. We declare war on Germany. You know, all these things together. So, um, you know, so so we were on that Allied side with Britain, we're with France, we're with the Soviet Union. You know, those are kind of the big four. But uh, in the Pacific, Australia is going to be a huge ally in fighting the Japanese. You know, Canada is going to be heavily involved. Um, so, so there's a lot of different countries on this Allied side. Um, in APUS, we focus mostly on the home front. Now, I'll talk about the war a little bit, um, but, but there's a lot of things happening at home that become very important for the future of the country. So, you know, we go into total war. And uh, it's something, you know, we did in World War I, but World War II is kind of a, a huge step up. And, and I think I've mentioned this stat in class before, but we actually spend more money on World War II than the rest the everything before that in US history combined. So our government spends more on World War II than from, you know, George Washington all the way up until that point through the New Deal. You know, so uh, we talk about how people were freaking out about how much the New Deal cost and World War II uh, that was pennies. And how we're going to do this is by converting, you know, the country to um, certain aspects that are going to help us in the war. So one of the things that the, the government creates is the War Production Board. And the goal of the War Production Board is to help convert companies that are were making stuff for Americans to make things for the war, right? So we have this big need, and we're going to change things over um, to that. Uh, so... You don't have to do it if you're a company, right? It's capitalism. You don't have to. But uh, there's big government money, and the government's got to pay you a lot more than, um, than than what you were making before on one hand. And the other hand is that, you know, they're going to help you make this conversion. So some examples, you know, let's say you were a company made fireworks for the 4th of July, right? Uh, the government might come to you. The War Production Board is going to come to you and say, hey, why don't you make grenades for us? You already have a lot of the supplies and setup. We'll show you how to do it. We'll pay you big money. Um, a Ford, you know, was a, a car, obviously made cars. And so why, why don't you make tanks? Why don't you make, you know, um, uh, trucks and, and things for, for the war effort? Um, absolutely, right? You're already kind of making these kind of products anyway. You might as well make the conversion, make a ton of money. That's great. So, you know, this, this, is, this is America in the home front. This is what we're moving toward from a, a, a economic perspective to keep these companies in the loop and keep these needs out there. The other thing is what our individual is doing is uh, rationing. You know, um, basically, there's not enough stuff, right, for every American and to send things off to war. Um, you know, so... Americans had to ration what they had, what, what you would get for certain products, so things like um, meat and lunch meat, um, rubber, so tires for your, for your car, um, you know, certain products, uh, leather, buying shoes, you know, th those type of things. You would get tickets in the mail. You actually get rationing tickets in the mail. And these tickets are what you would have to, to give to be able to purchase the product, you still have to buy the product, but you'd have to give that with it. So if I want to buy, you know, a pound of of uh, ham at the supermarket, I had to give a ticket for that pound of ham, or they couldn't let me buy it. You know, because so much meat was going over to uh, Europe, was going to the Pacific, that at home 
hey, we, we're not going to have enough for everyone, and so we're going to have to ration. So, you know, I, look, not to compare kind of the current situation to war, because uh, it's not the same, but, you know, it is very similar circumstance where there, there's a lot of needs right now with, with, with this quarantine out there, and you have a lot of companies that, you know, have to close or have adjusted or are making masks or making, you know, medical equipment. You know, that's kind of that production board. And, you know, at the same time you have this rationing, it's not forced rationing by the government, but, hey, you go to the supermarket, there's a lot of uh, shelves barren. Um, there's there's not enough stuff right now for what everyone needs. And so you have to kind of be smart with what you did. That was how World War II worked as well. Um, so, you know, that was... Um, that, that was kind of the main thing um, in terms of what people at home were doing. Now, in terms of work, right, we're going to see kind of what happened with World War I on steroids. Um, we need more soldiers than we needed in World War I. So the, the draft is in full effect. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. There are some problems with that. Um, and th the other thing that we see is most of these eligible men are going off and fighting in World War II. So we have this big labor um, hole that happens. And who's going to fill that hole? Women are going to be the, the, the number one group to fill that hole. You know, we saw it a little bit with World War I, but after World War I, things kind of went back to how they were, right? Women mostly were fired, you know, were let go. Men got their jobs back. Like we said, there were certain companies that said, hey, I could pay these women less. I'm going to keep them around. World War II is going to blow that out of the water because women are going to do such a great job at making products for the war. It's super important. And um, they're going to keep these jobs. Rosie the Riveter, right, a big symbol uh, of that. And, you know, next week, we're, we're going to start reviewing, and uh, our first topic of review is going to be women throughout U.S. history and uh, kind of following that group, you know, in case you get that uh, that question, uh, free response question or questions about women that you, you know what you're doing. So women, uh, World War II, you know, they're going to take a step forward. You got the right to vote now. Uh, so they can be politically active. Now they're going to work. They're working in these traditional male jobs and uh you know, do, doing great at it. We also have women in the military for the first time. Now, women are not going to be in combat, okay? Um, that's not something that's going to come until uh, the 2010s, uh, 2010s. But uh, women are going to actually be in the military, not just as nurses, you know, not just uh, kind of uh, tertiary pieces to, um, to the military. Uh, we're we're going to start... Um, their own female corps and groups within the military. The first one was in the army was, was WAC, um, the women army auxiliary corps. And we'll see each, um, branch of the military have their own. So the Navy has uh, waves, etc. Um, basically women are going to be this, um, auxiliary group that will be a part of the military. Um, so, that, you know, you're not fighting combat, but you're actually in the army, you know, you, you are, you're, you're moving supplies, you know, you still have the, the nursing jobs and all of that, but you have women who are engineers, you have women who are fixing equipment, you have women who are flying planes, you know, to, to refuel, to move supplies, to be support, you know, you have women that, that get caught in dog fights, you know, up there, like there, there are, this is the, the most that women have, um, had access to the military and at home to jobs. That was kind of the key. So, you know, this is going to be a, a very big step for women. Um, after the war, you, you really can't put that cat back in the bag, you know, world war one kind of after that, we try kind of tried to put, Women back in, in the, 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 the cult of domesticity place that they had um, after World War II, it's kind of blown out of the water, um, you know, and when, 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 when we eventually move on, you know, after the AP test, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that next step. Um, let's talk about Native Americans very quickly. You know, Native Americans are a group that we haven't touched too much upon um, recently, you know, uh, but... They, they were kind of in, in a, a tough situation, as Native Americans have been throughout U.S. history, um, where, 
Native, the reservation system had kind of been started, and you know, we've talked about how Native Americans have, have moved and been migrated and been pushed around um, the United States. And, you know, a lot of these reservations located in the Oklahoma area and, um, and started to expand to other areas as well. But um, Native Americans are going to volunteer for the war. You know, they, they're going to volunteer and they are going to serve in World War II. Uh, we're going to have a ton of Native Americans serving in World War II. And obviously, you know, the most famous piece of this was the Navajo Code Talkers, uh, where, you know, trying to come up with a code that could not get cracked, you know, that, that was a big piece of World War II because radio communication now is, it was such a, a big thing. And, uh, and honestly, it was pretty easy to get uh, anyone's, you know, radio communications. There wasn't the encryption that we have today, you know, uh, electronically to try and stop anyone that would get this information and not know what it was. So you had a talking code. And we had some really great um, people that were able to crack codes, you know, in America and other countries, um, uh, f f the access codes. But, you know, us trying to come up with a code to not get cracked was very difficult and that's where native americans came in we use the navajo language and the navajo code talkers not even all the native americans were navajo uh that that they used this but they they learned it quickly and used this to communicate and this line you know language was is is older predates you know it predates and is so separate from English and German and Japanese you know that this didn't have any influence of those languages right so that's the problem is when you come up with a code, uh, you know, there's an influence from, you know, when I come up with a code, I'm coming up with a code in English, you know, because that's what I know. Uh, or I'm coming up with code in German because that's what I know. So Navajo didn't have any influence of those. You know, it, it's it's not a, a, a language that had an influence elsewhere. So, you know, that was big. We have a code now that, that the Allied powers can use and not get cracked. Um so, you know, Native Americans, a big piece. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, after the war, aren't really, you know, treated in, uh, in a way to, to kind of respond to that and help them. Um, let's talk about African Americans. Um, it's kind of an interesting, intense situation, as it has been, right? Segregation is in full effect. And Jim Crow laws still in full effect today. And, you know, one of the big problems with the draft was that you had, you know, poor African Americans getting drafted and not really having a way out of it. You know, if, if you were more wealthy, if you were white, just like in the Civil War, you know, the Civil War is more direct. You could pay someone to take your spot. World War II didn't have that. But, you know, th there are ways out of it. There are ways to put this off. Uh, certain jobs, you know, uh, going to college, uh, you know, things like that. Um, something that we usually get a little more into when we talk about Vietnam. Um, but, you know, it was very similar to that. So you had a lot of uh, you know African American men getting drafted in the military. Now the military was segregated at this point. Blacks and whites could not serve together. People of color could not serve with whites. So this was all segregated, you know, by other races, Latinos and Native Americans, etc. And that was kind of accepted. That was not good. Um, but you know, that wasn't going to be the fight. Uh, during a war. This is going to be a fight kind of after the war. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly at the end here. But the other issue is that the federal government was not paying uh, soldiers of color the same as white soldiers. So they're actually getting paid less like you would see in a factory job. Now, that's a private business. You know, that's capitalism um, and the argument from those businesses, right, that we can pay women, we can pay African Americans less. We know that that shouldn't happen and that's that you know that the, the work is no different um but now you're talking about the federal government paying soldiers paying other workers who are black less than people who are white so we have a civil rights leader who's going to emerge and threaten um something very important and his name is a philip randolph he's kind of the the precursor to you know, martin luther king jr and you know the, this this peaceful protest movement that's going to come out in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s so when a philip randolph um he he develops a big protest for washington dc and we're going to have uh, uh the people of color we're going to have white supporters we're going to have everyone come to washington dc shut down the, the city 
you know, and, and protest this inequity uh, unless the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, meets with him and can guarantee some type of uh, change to this. So the, the, this is where we're at. Now we're in the middle of a war, shutting down your capital in the middle of a war, not, not good, not what you want to happen, right? So FDR does not want this to happen. And so uh, he had, a Philip Bruno has the plan set up for this big march, kind of speeches, we're going to march down to the Washington Monument and uh, shut it down. And so FDR doesn't want this to happen. He agrees to meet with a Philip Randolph, and they come to an agreement. FDR passes an executive order guaranteeing equal pay uh, across the board in any federal job, including the military, um, it cannot be changed based on race. So this big protest um, you know, gets put in a drawer. A Philip Randolph puts it away and... Uh, you may have guessed this is going to come back later as the March on Washington, uh, where Martin Luther King Jr. has his I Have a Dream speech, right? So this is something that's going to get utilized down the line. But for now, uh, that's that's kind of the, the replacement, and uh, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a big win at this point. Um, so the, the, the last group that I want to talk about before we kind of get into the war is is um, is, is Jap- Japanese Americans, and you know after Pearl Harbor, there's a big fear on the West Coast of Japanese Americans, of really all Asian Americans. Um, but we had kind of been, you know, we had kind of been um, uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, been excluding people from China for for a long time. Uh, so the Japanese Americans was a big fear. Could it was there espionage here? You know, are there spies in the United States from Japan? And how do we know? And how do we deal with that? So um, we basically picked the worst possible way of dealing with that. And um, what uh, the order that ends up being sent out is that Japanese Americans on the West Coast have two options. One is to move east. So they draw a line on the map. Basically, you can move to, you know, Illinois uh, east. Uh, so get away from the West Coast, get away from Japan, you know, you, you might be um, loyal to the Emperor of Japan, this will keep you away and you can't communicate, and that's it. The second option is to go to um, a, a, a detention facility, um, and, you know, I think they had a nicer name for it, um, and stay there until the war's over. And then you can come back, you can get your house, uh, you can get your, um, get your business back, you know, you don't have to move, so that's an option too. So, this, um, you know, there were some legality issues. Can the federal government tell a group of people, hey, we're going to keep you basically in a, a prison, you can't leave, um, until this war is over? This goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules a very important ruling for the future of America. And that ruling is that in times of war, um, to kind of keep the peace and keep everyone safe, that the government can do almost whatever it wants to do, uh, that that they can do this. So, um, A, Japanese internments ago, and B, this is going to set a precedent that down the line, national security becomes the most important thing um, ever. And so the government can almost do whatever they want to do for that national security. So FDR signs an executive order uh, giving a date for Japanese Americans to move or be put into these uh, detention centers, these uh, internment camps is what what uh, we call them today, where um, they're going to be interned, they're going to be put there, and that's it. Construction began immediately on numerous sites throughout the western United States, a lot in California, all the way as far east as uh, Arkansas. Um, so, you know, if you're a Japanese American and this is happening, you know, a lot did choose to move. Uh, Chicago has a very high Japanese American population today because a lot moved to that closest big city that they could, and that was Chicago, Illinois. Um, many didn't because if you have a business, you have a nice house, you have a good life, like this seems like the better end of the deal, right? Uh, you, you move somewhere for, for a little bit and you come back and everything's fine. So a, a lot stayed and the military, you know, put orders on people's homes um, and escorted them to a facility that was completed. You know, some of them traveled halfway across the country. 
Some of these internment camps were more secure, quote unquote. Um, we're talking barbed wire. We're talking tanks. Um, Tule Lake in California was was kind of the the, the most um, secure, quote unquote, facility um, where. You know, you're being treated as a prisoner, and there's tanks going around the outside. You're kind of saying, hey, you're bad. You have to be put in this prison. But you didn't do anything. You didn't commit a crime. Um, not one person. There's about 25,000 uh, Japanese Americans who were interned. Not one was found to have been a spy uh, before or after the fact. So, um, so uh, Japanese Americans were interned. Now, here's, the, here's a lot of problems that came with this. One, um, the land was terrible. Uh, you know, the government's not picking great land to put this on. So the swamps of Arkansas and the, the, the desert of California uh, is where these, these internment camps are made. It's not good. Um, you know, you don't have a house. You have There's a big room with a bunch of beds. That's where you're sleeping. You know, there's not much to do. That's a problem. Um, the second thing is money. Uh, this was not financed. You know, so how... You know, you build the facilities, that costs a lot of money. And that's that's about all the money they had. So what do you have to do when you have 25,000 people in, in a, a prison? You know, you have to feed them. You have to have, um, you have, to have showers and toilets and, uh, you know, all, all these kind of necessities of life. They didn't really have, you know, now uh, they'll, they'll have plumbing, they'll have toilets, uh, they'll eventually have some type of hygiene um, included there. But food was a big issue. So here's the brilliant idea that the government comes up with. Let's have them grow their own food. Then, A, we don't have to pay for food. And they can just grow their own food. Once again, we're in the worst land area possible. Um, it's really hard to grow food in a swamp. It's really hard to grow food in a desert. That fails miserably. The government has to, you know, there's protests uh, within these internment camps. The government has to feed them. Um, the other thing the government did that really backhanded was um, they gave out a loyalty survey to these, these interned Japanese Americans. And um, this loyalty survey uh, was basically kind of a catch-all to say, hey, we have to keep these Japanese uh, Americans here because they pose a threat, right? They want to kind of want to prove the threat uh, for, the, for the Supreme Court case uh, existing. So, um, you know, to kind of two big questions that were posed to do this. One was, will you take up arms... Um, uh, against enemies of the United States, uh, fast. Now, this is asked to every Japanese American. So, you know, and, and it's, if you were, you know, a 15 year old girl, if you were um, an 80 year old woman, you know, you'd say, yeah, I'm gonna pick up a gun and start shooting it at, at uh, Japanese, uh, you know, the Japanese uh, country. You know, you might say, no, I, I physically can't do that. And they say, well, well, you you must be an enemy. We have to keep you here. The other one was a big one. Because it posed a question that uh, could, did not have a right answer. So um, the, the question was, do you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? So <clears throat> this had two questions in it. So no matter what you answered, you were wrong. Um, you have to say, you know, if you say no, then you're not swearing loyalty to the United States. We got to keep you in this internment camp. If you say yes... Uh, I, I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then you are forswearing your loyalty to the emperor, meaning you are rejecting the emperor of Japan. Now, to do that, that means that you used to be loyal to the emperor, right? If you're going to, it means I had loyalty to him, now I'm forswearing it, I'm done with my loyalty to him. So, they're going to say, hey, you used to have loyalty to the emperor, we have to keep you here. So, this this was the data that they used to say, like, every single person, something, something is dangerous here. Uh, and that, that's wrong. You know, this is the big black eye of World War II on the United States. Um, we've had, you know, four different presidents, both Democrats and Republicans, apologize for this after the fact. We've had uh, reparation payments to those families um, that were interned. Because guess what? When your business isn't running for two years, three years, you know, you're going to lose it. Um, and then when you know, these those interned Japanese Americans were let out, um, they go back to their homes. What happened? Well, they the, their homes were completely torn apart, right? The government just confiscated you and basically said you're an enemy so um vandalism you know every, they, every every home was robbed uh japanese businesses were destroyed 
they lost everything, even if they um, went here. It, you know, it, it, was, it was completely wrong. And um, looking back, it, it's such a bad decision. It's something to learn from, you know, because we have this fear sometimes when we have an enemy, you know, and, and it's happened here. It's happened after 9-11 to, um, to Muslim Americans. You know, you can't let this fear take over. Um, and not one person that was in turn was found to have been a spy. So, um so let me kind of clean up uh, the war a little bit here um, that, you know, the so for, for in the Atlantic, um, we're going to be fighting against the German Italians. Um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower is going to be the, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. Um, we actually start in North Africa. Uh, the, the Italians are moving through North Africa. Their goal is to capture the Suez Canal from the British, and we help stop that. Um, and um, George Patton was the general on the ground um, who kind of combats um, Erwin Rommel, the desert fox, who had uh, he was very good at, 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 at desert combat. Okay, um, he had his Africa Corps tanks that he used in World War One. Kind of a, of a funny story of how Patton combats him is that Rummel was was a World War One you know general was very good and uh, he wrote a best selling book after that about his kind of war strategy so you know we, we bought the book Patton bought the book he read it you know he kind of figured out what this strategy was so and the Allies push them back into Italy very quick recap you know um, we will uh, end up capturing Italy and end up handing over um, Mussolini. To the Italian people who end up putting him on trial. By that point, they they're kind of sick of, of him. Their economy has has gone down uh, the drain. Um, and then, you know, we go to liberate France. Uh, France has been taken by Germany. That's D-Day, uh, where the Allies go in. And, and there's there's some 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 good stories there that maybe I'll share um, for you know some ways that we try to trick the Germans and and brought in some other people. Uh, some really interesting stories. That uh, I can't quite get into to today, but uh, you know we end up liberating France after a long, hard fight. We're talking almost a million people killed, um, and then we go into Germany, and, and that's kind of it. Once France is liberated, you know the Atlantic is going to be won. Um, one of the big issues is on the the Eastern Front. You know the Soviet Union's fighting Germans. They're asking us for help, and and we do not help them. So um, the Soviet Union loses the most people in the war. And uh, it doesn't leave a good taste in their mouth for from America, especially uh, for not helping them. We'll talk more about that uh, after the AP test. Um, so, you know, the, the Russians actually get to Berlin first. Adolf Hitler uh, ends up marrying his girlfriend, uh, Eva Braun, and they, they both take poison. He shoots himself. They kill themselves, um, and the so Soviets take his body. Uh, in the Pacific, they're fighting the Japanese. Um, and Japanese are island hopping. They're going from island to island, trying to capture as many islands as possible. They get kind of stonewalled by the Australians in Australia. Um, uh, some other good stories about that. But, um, you know, we end up, you know, fighting and pushing back. Uh, you know, it takes a while. We are, we are undermanned. Um, and, and this combat in the Pacific is not, you know, ships firing at each other. It's planes. You know, it, it's airplane combat. So uh, that's kind of a difference. You know, eventually uh, we have we have the Battle of Midway's big turning point in the war. We finally get a big win. Um, and the the Battle of Coral Sea is really where we see planes start being used for the first time. So you know, there's a lot of battles in there that you don't have to know, uh, but uh, it is interesting. Something we can talk about when we get back to school. Um, politically, FDR wins his fourth election. Uh, and people are scared of that power. Um, he he kind of can just keep winning till he dies. Um, he does die very quickly after winning his fourth election. And his vice president Harry Truman um, was a was a um, a congressman from Missouri, and uh, he's going to take over toward the end of this war. And honestly, he takes over and has a really tough decision to make. Um, you know, what we have at the end, we've gotten to, to Japan. Japan has not surrendered. And what do you do? You know, what do you do here? Uh, ultimately, you have to decide, 
do we invade Japan? You know, the estimate is about 500,000 Allied soldiers' lives will be lost. More Japanese soldier lives will be lost. That's a lot of people. We're talking over a million people will die on a Japanese invasion. Or do you drop the atomic bomb? Now, you know, we have been developing the atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project, um, kind of secretly using, uh, you know, uh, Robert Oppenheimer and a team of, honestly, a lot of scientists that were um, kicked out by the Nazis were, were Jewish scientists who are working on the atomic bomb. And, and we test it in Nevada and, um, you know, it works. It, it's going to obliterate everything it touches. And, um, you know, Truman has this decision where you can kill, you know, 500,000 allied lives and, and plus, you know, at least another 500,000 Japanese soldiers, or, we can drop the bomb on Japan. Obviously, we make that decision to drop the bomb in Japan. Um, Truman talked about it. this was the hardest decision of his life. It kept him up at night, you know, of what, what to do. Either way, you're kind of make, he felt like he's making a bad decision. Now, the downside of dropping the bomb, obviously, is that 90% of the lives lost are going to be civilians, Japanese civilians. Uh, and we don't really know the full effects of the bomb. So, you know, we, we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and, uh, and then Nagasaki, Right, uh, the immediate lives lost in Hiroshima about seventy-five thousand, Nagasaki about twenty-five thousand. It's rough estimates, um, and it's not including a lot of the effects. Something we could talk about when we get back to school um, or after the AP test. Um, so you know that decision was difficult. Um, ultimately, you know from this, Japan's going to surrender. Now you know in American history, a lot of times we say hey, Japan's going to surrender, um, and because we drop the bomb, that's it. Well. It was something we found out more recently uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, we actually found a we uh, you know it actually was found by by the Japanese um, a, a journal from the, the uh, secretary of the emperor and kind of jotting down notes of meetings that they had about surrender and the atomic bomb you know was uh, on the forefront. Um, but the emperor wasn't too concerned about civilian lives lost. That you know that wasn't his big concern. He just wanted to keep the country. And so without an invasion, we're not going to take Japan like um, like we took the Soviet Union. When they had moved the Germans out of the Soviet Union, they kind of took all the countries along the way: Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, you know, uh, Romania. You know, they took these countries under the Soviet wing. So the Soviets actually were. Uh, were moving troops toward the Japanese border on the Creo Islands, and uh, they had amassed over one million uh, Soviet troops, and so they were ready to invade if we weren't going to invade. And uh, you know, the emperor knew that he would lose Japan. You know, it would be under Soviet control. So he surrendered, and you know, we gave it back to the Japanese and actually helped them rebuild after that. The aftermath of the war, uh, Soviet Union emerges as a gigantic power, and America emerges as a gigantic power. France has to rebuild. You know, Britain is getting bombed nightly. They have to rebuild, uh, and that's kind of where we're at. So I went a little over my time. Hopefully it's all right. Uh, but there's uh, U.S. entry in World War II in a nutshell. That's the whole chapter, and that is the end of the course in terms of what will be tested on the AP test. That's what we'll focus on until the AP test. Then after the AP test, we'll finish the course. Uh, so if you have questions, you know, put them in the comments in Google Classroom. Shoot me an email, shallum at kosd.org. I'll be happy to answer those questions for you. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and hit it up. So uh, have a good one.